Fuck. <laughs> Hello, I'm Patrick Cronin, Asia Pacific Security Chair here at the Hudson Institute, and I want to welcome you to a special program to talk with the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army about the future of the Army in the Indo-Pacific region. It's a timely topic. We couldn't have uh, better leaders of our Army, I would say, right now in terms of our civilian and military leadership. Um, Secretary of the Army Christine Wormuth uh, has a career of achievement in both uh, analysis and policy. Um, her analytical chops at CSIS, where I also worked, um, but more recently at RAND, where she was in charge as the director of the International Security and Defense Policy Center, which may not be well known to people outside the defense community, but it really is a hub of strategic analysis and thinking directly going into shaping policy at a high level. Um, but she has served at high level in policy, including as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, which really is the top policy job uh, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. But she's also served at the National Security Council as Senior Director for Defense and other, many other positions. So Christine, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, General James McConville, uh, is the 40th uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, a West Point graduate, uh, an Army aviator, extensive combat duty, the longest serving wartime commander of the 101st Airborne Division, uh, what Bob Gates dubbed the tip of the spear, uh, commander of the Long Knife 4th Brigade 1st Cavalry Division in Operation Iraqi Freedom, a great deal of operational experience and leadership. Between the two of them, we have the combined arms that are helping to train, equip, and organize our great U.S. Army. Um, but these are parlous times. Um, and the Indo-Pacific strategy that was released just last month uh, talked about shifting toward our priority theater, and then, boom, war, uh, you know, when you least expect it, or maybe when you do expect it, nonetheless, it uh, creates global uh, reverberations for security forces. So, Secretary Wormuth, um, if I could turn to you, um, and then General McConville to you for some brief initial comments, then maybe we could uh, follow up with some conversation. Sure, Patrick. First of all, thank you so much for having the Chief and I here. We're delighted to be here. Um, you know, right at the top, I would say it's, it's really important that we as a country and as an army, I think, be able to um, walk and chew gum, you know, keep our eye on China, keep focused on the Indo-PACOM theater while doing everything we're doing in uh, Europe to, to, you know, make sure that we are deterring aggression against NATO and supporting Ukraine, for example. I thought I would just talk uh, a little bit about sort of what I see as three lines of effort for the army in the Indo-Pacific. Um, first is active campaigning, which is sort of, you know, what we're doing day to day to sort of set the theater, make sure that we have combat credible forces in theater for deterrence. And then to talk a little bit about integrated deterrence, a, a concept that you've heard Secretary Austin talk about that I think you'll see much more of uh, when the national defense strategy comes out. And then to just say a few words about, you know, if deterrence fails, uh, what the Army could be called upon to do in, in the Indo-Pacific. So in terms of active campaigning, I think you know, one thing that not everyone realizes is that two-thirds of the countries in the Indo-PACOM theater have CHODs who are Army generals. Uh, in most of those countries, the Army is sort of the center of gravity militarily. And that means that we have terrific relationships with the armies in most of those countries. And the chief can talk you know, very specifically and personally about the relationships he has with his counterparts. But that allows us, I think, to uh, really expand on something that I think is a comparative advantage for us, which is our network of allies and partners. So what we're trying to do with our active campaigning is to be very present in the Indo-PACOM theater. And we're doing that, for example, through uh, what General Flynn, our US Army Pacific commander, calls Operation Pathways, or sometimes you'll hear people say Pacific Pathways. And it's really just a series of exercises that we have with countries in the region. So for example, we have you know, the big talisman saber exercise with Australia. We've got Cobra Gold in Thailand, uh, Balakatan in the Philippines. Um, um, we have a, you know, a major exercise with Singapore, for example. We have another big exercise with India. And, and really what we're trying to do with a lot of the countries in that region is build interoperability. You know, it's going beyond building partner capacity. It's really building interoperability and creating opportunities to increase access and basing where we can if we needed to in a crisis. 
Uh, another, you know, a very important part of how the Army is contributing to active campaigning in the Indo-Pacific is through our Security Force Assistance Brigade, the 5th SFAB, um, which is about, you know, 800 uh, NCOs who are able to sort of divide up and go to multiple places in the theater and, again, do a lot of that interoperability um, development with allies and partners in the region. So, you know, shifting a little bit to integrated deterrence, a big part of what we're doing is, of course, again, having combat credible forces in the theater, but it also connects back to what we're trying to do in the Army in terms of modernization. Uh, we are modernizing uh, in a very significant way, the most significant way in 40 years. We have sort of six different areas of modernization, um, all of which are relevant to the Indo-Pacific, but I would highlight in particular air and missile defense, network, uh, long-range precision fires, future vertical lift. And, you know, we are working very hard to bring forward major new weapon systems and capabilities that will, I think, very much underwrite our ability to deter coercion in the theater. And the last thing I would just say is, you know, if deterrence were to fail, I think the Army has a, a number of roles that it will play in that kind of a conflict. You know, there's a, a real tendency to focus on Indo-PACOM as solely an air and maritime theater. And I think that um, looks past the fact that the Army will be central to, you know, I call it sort of the linchpin of the joint force. We will be central to setting up bases uh, where the joint force can stage from. We will be critical to securing them. Again, that gets back to air and missile defense. The long range um, precision fires, you know, our, our multi-domain task force will have a uh, a fires but you know battery uh, that could include the long range hypersonic weapon it could include you know we have a number it could include our mid range capability um, and then we also will be key i think to command and control to sustainment uh, and of course if necessary to providing forces for counterattacks so there's you know as i said at a speaking engagement last week there's very much still a role for soldiers on the ground uh, even in the indo pacific so i'll just stop there and then in the homeland as well. well. If it comes there, right, Absolutely. with cyber. Um, which, it, which sadly, you know, the homeland really isn't a sanctuary anymore. And I think, you know, if we were to get in a real shooting war, our homeland would be part of the theater. Excellent. We'll come back to some of these points. But General McConville. No, I think, you know, as, as following the Secretary's uh, lead on this thing, which I think is very, very important, is you know, the relationships that we have with our allies and partners there. You know, many of the chiefs of staffs or the, or the chiefs of defense mm -hmm. they have gone to our schools, we've worked together uh, over the years, and as a result, we have a very, very strong relationship, and they are very integral into really allowing us access and to allowing us to be present. We work very closely with their forces, and, and that helps us um, build their capacity, build their capabilities, and, and also really important, the fact where they're reinforcing them or at least reassuring them the will to uh, defend their countries. And I think everyone realizes that that's in the theater is they, they want a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, they want to uh, have prosperous lives and, um, you know, they don't want to have to make tough choices about who they're with or what, what's going on. They just want to be able to live their lives. And I think we're giving them that opportunity. Uh, in many cases, we're the security partner of choice, and we work very closely with them. And I think that's one of the things we provide as a military force. Um, excellent. Well, there's a lot to follow up on, on these points, but I want to turn back to Secretary Wormuth and just talk a bit about the Indo-Pacific strategy that was released last month. And you made the point that we have to walk and chew gum. I think everybody who works on Indo-Pacific knows that we're a global power and that we, and the Army in particular has global responsibilities and you see the interchangeability of brigade combat teams and where they can be dispatched and how they can be used. Um, so it's not really either or. Um, nonetheless, the fact that we have this uh, Russian invasion, unprovoked war suddenly emerging uh, in Europe and, and potentially escalating threat of chemical and biological weapons, nuclear uh, level, how is that affecting your plans to try to make sure the Army can walk and chew gum in terms of be ready for deterring potential conflict should it arise you know, in uh, East or South China Seas, for instance, or on the Korean Peninsula? Yeah, well, I would say a few things about that, Patrick. I mean, I, I think, first of all, you know, we, we have, you know, you, know, you know, as we look at our different war plans, contingency plans, you know, we try to make sure that we have an Army that's sized to be able to meet the demands that we think are out there. 
And, uh, you know, we are, because we've done, I think, a very good job of maintaining readiness, we've been able to, you know, deploy forces from the United States to Europe quite rapidly. But we still have, you know, we still have our forces on the Korean Peninsula. We still have forces in indo pacom that are, you know, assigned and allocated to Admiral Aquilino. Um, and, you know, we're working very hard, I think, to try to maintain deterrence even as we do the things that we are doing in Europe. And, of course, I think an important part in this day and age of maintaining deterrence is our nuclear uh, triad. You know, that's sort of the ultimate insurance policy, and I think that's something that uh, our adversaries have to bear in mind, frankly, as they think about um, contemplating opportunistic aggression. Well, on that nuclear issue, since you raised it, I mean, we have allies, including in Japan, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, talking about the need to at least start debating, should we be housing U.S. nuclear weapons? Because how do we strengthen extended deterrence to make sure that a, a potential adversary like China doesn't miscalculate, or North Korea as well? Um, and so there's an open debate, and also in South Korea, with the newly elected president-elect, mm -hmm. uh, Yoon suk yeol um, So, you know, extended deterrence. Um, partly it's dealing with the people and, and those relationships and making sure they trust us. Partly it's having those troops on the ground as we do when you think about the Eighth Army in Korea. But how, how can we help prevent, um, how can we make sure that potential adversaries understand our determination uh, to defend our allies and partners with all available means? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a number of ways that you can go about that. And it's, it's been a while, frankly, since I've been in the, you know, in sort of into the, the heart of nuclear policy. But, but I do know, you know, we have an entire uh, dimension of our alliance with the rocks, for example, that talks about extended deterrence. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, a whole platform there to try to make sure that they have confidence in our extended deterrence. And I think, you know, I would... Um, Again, it's been a while since I've sort of been in these debates, but, you know, I would be hesitant to contemplate, for example, you know, bringing nuclear weapons back to the peninsula, for example. Um, but I think, you know, that's why we have forums with the Koreans to be able to talk about those kinds of issues, and the Japanese as well. And, and as you know well, the issue of, you know, whether Japan should develop its own mm -hmm. nuclear weapons is a bit of a hardy perennial that sort of ebbs and flows. Um, but I think it is very important that we, you know, ta have a very robust dialogue in both of those alliances about extended deterrence so that they do have confidence. And I know we've been beefing up air and missile defenses, and that's maybe the, an easier way to defend our allies and partners through defensive means like those systems. I see a Patriot battery getting uh, called into service right now on the Korean Peninsula just in response to Kim Jong-un's latest missile threats. Mm -hmm. um, uh, General McConville, I was... Um, reading through your um, uh, Chief of Staff Army reading list. Um, and I was struck uh, by the very first reading, <laughs> which was FM 7.0, um, the field manual for training. And I thought, yeah. what an appropriate uh, thing to read at this, you know, this time. Um, and I started to go through it, and it's, it, it's, it's better the reading than you would expect for somebody who's much more comfortable reading Colin Gray or, or some of the other <laughs> books on your list. Um, it starts off with a winning attitude, first of all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and people, and it, it basically says to all the troops, if you want to win, right. understand these concepts first, right. and then we'll build from there, and we'll do right. it together. But yeah. you want to just talk about how we're training, you know, the Army to be prepared for the wars we see happening and, and that could happen? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, if you take a look at, you know, the Secretary and I, we talk, we talk about people first, and it's really getting, you know, our people highly trained, disciplined and fit. It's about building cohesive units uh, in our organizations because, as we see, when it comes to conflict, you can have all the capabilities, which is the best gear. You can have a, a lot of capacity, which is a whole bunch of gear. But if your soldiers don't have the will to fight, if they don't believe in what they're doing, if they don't believe in their leadership, they're not going to stay when things get hard. And I think you see that happen in Ukraine right now, where they believe they may not have the best kit, they may not have the most of it, uh, but they're standing strong because they believe in their country and they believe in their leadership. It is impressive and also horrifying to see what they're having to fight with in the civilian population and urban warfare yeah. uh, on television, essentially, right. and on Twitter. Um, are, are we prepared for that kind of fight? No, I think, I think we are. I think, um, you know, our troops, uh, we, we've seen it. You know, those who have fought in Iraq, we fought in, you know, Saudi City, we fought in Baghdad, we fought uh, in Fallujah and the Jaff. And so our, our soldiers are, are, are very well trained for those type of operations. And, um, 
And, but we can never take our eye off the ball. That's why readiness for us is, is one of our top priorities. You know, um, Secretary Wormuth, when I think about uh, Taiwan or the Koreans or the Japanese, I could see them being just as much in the fight completely to protect their interests and their sovereignty. And yet I think about the PLA. They've not had any recent combat experience, but they've got a formidable modernization plan that they've been working on for years. How do you characterize and think about the PLA challenge or threat to the region and to our allies and as well as to our direct interests? Well, I'm, you know, quite concerned, obviously, about the PLA threat. I mean, as, as you know well and, you know, all of the folks, I'm sure, who are uh, watching this forum, they've embarked on a very impressive, you know, 20-year effort to comprehensively modernize their military, you know, across uh, every single service, you know, the creation of the strategic rocket forces, um, it, you know, they, as you said, they have very impressive capabilities. Now, I have always been of the view that one of the, you know, we, we obviously continue to have overmatch in the undersea domain, for example. But I think another really important area where we have a strong comparative advantage is in our soldiers. It's in that human dimension. You know, A, our force has 20 years of combat experience, um, you know, holistically, if you will. Uh, but it has the kind of training that General McConville was just talking about. I think, you know, we have a much more um, uh, decentralized, empowered force, I think, than the People's Liberation Army. So those are areas I don't think we should be complacent at all about that because I know that the PLA has been studying us, looking, you know, they've made some major reorganizations uh, to become more joint, for example. So I think they are, you know, watching the way that we train and maintain readiness very carefully. But I still think we have some important advantages. And I think, you know, again, and the chief mentioned this also, I think one of the really key things that's happening right now, if you're Japan or Taiwan or South Korea, is looking at the difference in the will to fight and the fact that the Ukrainians are fighting. Um, and, and frankly, you know, the Ukrainians have done a lot of work since 2014 in particular to increase their proficiency. And I think, you know, that's something that um, I would imagine that the Taiwan, Taiwanese are looking at uh, carefully. There was some very impressive testimony this past week. Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, Eli Ratner mm -hmm. um, uh, talking about the PLA and the challenge, uh, building on the uh, administration's new Indo-Pacific strategy. Admiral Aquilino as well talking about the priority theater and how we were going to continue to be focusing on building capability. Um, but very much wary and aware that the Chinese um, could escalate their own gray zone sort of, uh, uh, sort of coercion uh, on allies and partners. And indeed, that's what we thought maybe Russia was doing against Ukraine until they jumped above uh, the gray zone and hybrid warfare into, into more direct kinetic action. Um, so are we um, prepared for that kind of leap, a sudden... Um, attack, either a, it could be a North Korean attack or it could be a Chinese seizing a, an island in the South China Sea or suddenly putting a, an offshore island of ta Taiwan. Is the Army ready to work with the Joint Force on these contingencies right now today? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, I would ask the Chief to talk. We, we were actually just in a meeting a couple hours ago <laughs> um, on what we call Project Convergence, uh, which is sort of our uh, premier sort of campaign of experimentation. And one of the things I think that's so important about what we're doing there is that we are working together with the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, Space Force, and looking ahead to our Project Convergence 22, we're going to be um, bringing in some of our uh, closest allies. But that's where we're trying to really look at some of our new uh, technologies and how we tie them together. You know, how do we get an F-35 to be able to send data to an army platform on the ground, for example? Um, but that's the kind of stuff we are working on right now. And I don't know, if, Chief, if you'd want to elaborate on that. I think uh, as the Secretary said, as you know, we're, we're ready today, but we're not satisfied where we're at. We've got to modernize the army, and we want to keep that overmatch we have. And, and, and one of the general concepts we're working on, as, as Secretary talked about, is you know the future to us. It's about um, speed. It's about range, and it's about convergence. And so you have weapon systems that may go really fast, they may go really far, but when you bring them together with convergence and you pass data very, very quickly, you can get effects, uh, lethal effects on a target much faster than we ever did before. So tens of seconds, vice tens of minutes or tens of hours, 
And that gives you decision dominance, which quite frankly gives you, gives you the overmatch we need. And the ability to sink ships, the ability uh, to suppress uh, air defense in, the, in these capabilities is a deterrence factor, knowing that some may want to seize an island or they want to do those type things. And if you're going to seize an island, that means you're doing, you know, one of three types of operations or maybe all three. You're doing an amphibious operation, you're doing an airborne operation, or you're doing an air assault operation. All those are very complex. Uh, they take highly trained troops to do it. And anyone, you know, with, with a certain capability can impede that from happening. You know, and the other thing I would add, uh, Patrick, is that, you know, not only do we have incredibly proficient soldiers, but we have incredibly capable leaders and leaders who are able to bring together allied and partner capabilities. So if you look at, for example, uh, you know, Eric Carrilla, who's about to go be our CENTCOM commander, or General C.D. Donahue, who who just, um, you know, there was a change of command, so he was the commander of 82nd Airborne, now he's 18th Airborne Corps. But uh, they are, you know, out in Europe now, and again, not just, not just commanding and uh, making sure that our soldiers are able to do what they're doing, but to bring together allied and partner capabilities so that we can work together. And that's another thing I think that we have an advantage over the PLA. You know, we are used to working in coalitions. Um, on the ground and have, you know, real-time experience in doing that in a way that they do not. Um, it, it's all very impressive. On the, on the convergence side, I wanted to come back to both sort of the high end and the low end of that. On the low end, let me start there because of the, the Russian military operation in Ukraine seems uh, a, a, a set of lessons on what not to do. <laughs> um, I mean, besides the big strategic miscalculation and to have bad policy, um, you, you know, the logistics, I mean, even ammunition and water and food running out from their armor columns. What, how, how could they do this, for one thing? I mean, I don't, no. what were they thinking? This is premeditated and planned, and that's, and that's... Well, you know, the old adage, you know, professional study logistics and, you know, amateur study tactics. But, I mean, the, the plan was a very complex plan mm. uh, when you took a look at it, you know. And I think, you know, a lot of people had seen the plan, and uh, it was multiple axes and then had airborne-type operations, aerosol-type operations, and even amphibious operations all involved in that. And the proof becomes in the execution. In order to do that, you have to have highly trained soldiers that are able to do that. And if you have a conscript army where people only come on duty for a year, you know, when you go into the Super Bowl, you, you may not have the, you know, the right people to execute that. And if you haven't run those type of operations before, while you're contested, they become very, very challenging. And I think ev everyone that has done those type of operations uh, only the very, very best could execute that plan, and now we're seeing some of the challenges that go along with that. Yeah, when you see conscripts sort of being captured, wandering around the battlefield and lost and abandoning their armor. It, it takes a long time to train soldiers, and, you know, we're very blessed. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a non-commissioned officer corps uh, with the United States Army, so as the Secretary said, a lot of our non-commissioned officers have three, four, five, six combat tours, and they've been doing it for a long time, and you know, it, it, you know, it'd be like a professional football team. If you only played one year and you have to go to the Super Bowl and you didn't get to practice much, it's probably not, not the best team to bring to the game. So this sounds like the state of the Army is very good right now in 2022, even though we want to get better. Um, but we're bringing on all this transformation, all this technology, all these new investments in, in modernization. So on the higher end of this convergence, is there a, a cost to be paid as we bring in these new technologies and we introduce the speed and the, and the and, and other attributes, whether it's hypervelocity missiles or um, the new vertical lift uh, platforms that we're trying to build? You know, I see two areas of risk, Patrick. I mean, one of them, I think one of the hardest things the chief and I have to do is, you know, look at our uh, finite set of army resources and make judgments about how to spend that money, you know, and the kind of once in 40 years modernization push that we're going on is, is not inexpensive. So that's, that's a big bill right there. But we've also got to make sure we're maintaining readiness. We've got to make sure that our soldiers and families have, you know, good houses to live in, good barracks, um, and, you know, and have quality of life. So managing all of that simultaneously uh, is a challenging thing. You know, there's always going to be another set of barracks that we'd like to upgrade. There's always, you know, we'd always like to get, um, you know, a, another improvement to our quality of life programs, for example. So those kinds of choices, that's, that's a challenge, I would say, if you, as we sort of embark on this major transformation. 
And then I think the other um, potential risk area I see is there is going to come a point, we're not there yet, where, um, you know, we, I sort of think in terms of three time frames. We, we have the Army we have right now that we're trying to improve, you know, and sort of the current five-year defense program is really focused on that. Where can we add in capabilities? And then, you know, um, 10 years out there is that Army where we fully brought online future vertical lift, um, you know, next generation combat vehicles, all those types of things. But there's going to be that midterm transition phase where I sort of think of it, it's like you're on a trapeze, you know, you're holding on and then you've got to let go to grab the next, um, I don't, you know, trapeze thing, whatever it is. Um, but that moment where you let go and you're in between, there's some risk there. So I think that, you know, crossing that bridge safely when we get to it is going to be something we'll have to pay a lot of attention to. Now, I assume it's partly because we're introducing these platforms while we're keeping the old ones at the same time. So we're, exactly. we're minimizing risk in that right. sense. But, but General, I'm, I'm wondering, as, a, as somebody who's flown helicopters, and I'm watching those Russian helicopters be shot down with fairly simple hardware that yeah. we're helping to provide, if we're going a lot faster and we're in a very expensive helicopter and we're shot down with a relatively inexpensive weapon, although it can cost maybe $800,000, I think, for a Stinger missile, nonetheless, um, are we able to afford to build enough platforms or are they going to be able to protect these platforms in yeah. the kind of combat environments of the yeah, future? Yeah, I think we can. And we've, okay. we've done a lot of analysis to make sure. You know, interesting enough, if you take a look at um, the Turkish UAV, which they call the TB2, mm. that's flying around yes. pretty much what we would consider almost a, a legacy system flying around at altitude. You would think any good air defense system would take that down. I don't know why it hasn't, you know, mm. and, and so, um, but with, with our aircraft, uh, as we look into the future, it'll be manned and unmanned aircraft. We'd like to lead with unmanned aircraft to uh, kind of set the conditions. Uh, there's certain protection systems that, are, you know, we could, can't really talk about in this thing that we have for our aircraft. There's also tactics, techniques, and procedures, how we employ those aircraft and uh, when you use them, do you use them at night, do you use them during the day? So, uh, you know, we're pretty comfortable with where we're going, what we're doing, that we need that capability. But it's just not, we don't want to be a one option force. You know, flying helicopters by themselves is probably not the way you want to do it. You want to use multiple options and, and really present multiple dilemmas to the person uh, that you're engaging against. Mm. Um, I wonder if we can switch back to the Korean Peninsula a bit because mm -hmm. it's on my mind. Kim Jong-un is uh, threatening to launch uh, ICBM and, and the U.S. has said that uh, the last two missile tests that he's conducted uh, of more than a, a dozen this year already uh, were oriented toward building a new monster ICBM, the Hwasong-17, which was on parade uh, back in October 2020, I believe. Um, if North Korea um, conducts a test that uh, leads to um, a threat to Korea, to Japan, to the United States, um, are we prepared to uh, and ready to, to work uh, with a, an effective response? I'm thinking about the lack of exercising that we've been doing in recent years with the Korean Pen Peninsula, partly to feed into the diplomacy of trying to negotiate uh, constraints on North Korea. So are we ready now? Are we going to pick up where President-elect Yoon is talking about? Let's resume military exercises uh, as soon as possible. Let's uh, redouble our efforts on defenses, air and missile defenses. Um, how do you assess the Army's readiness and the Joint Force readiness in a Korean scenario? Well, I think certainly I think the Army is, you know, ready to do what uh, what it's what it's going to be called upon to do potentially in Korea. General Le Camera was just in town and he and I talked about that. So, you know, we're we're ready to do what what he needs uh, and what, again, Admiral Aquilino needs. I think, you know, some of the trains, you know, some of the exercise activity changed because of the pandemic, obviously. I mean, it wasn't just mm -hmm. the diplomacy, but there was that. But, you know, we've continued to conduct training, as you know, with the South Koreans. And I think, um, you know, with the new administration, sort of where that training goes and whether it scales back up again and to what degree will really be sort of a, a, a U.S.-South Korea alliance decision. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, if there is a, a decision by the alliance to scale that um, training back up, you know, I think the, the Army would be uh, ready to participate in that and do what's needed. What do you think, General? Are we 
ready to scale up our exercise? No, I, I think so. I think, you know, if you've seen our training philosophy in the Army, it's really, you know, if you could put it into a, um, this may not make sense, but it, it really looks like a wedding cake. So we want to spend the most time on our soldiers, our squads, the platoons, and work our way up to the top. And when you get highly trained soldiers at the bottom, then when you come up with a plan, they can execute it. You know, and so what you're seeing is a lot of the bigger exercises uh, are more helpful with the logistics. But the units that we send there, you know, they're already fully trained before they go. And we rotate forces in there. They're at, you know, our, our highest level of readiness when they go there, and they continue to practice that. So I'm very confident in the Army units that go there that they're ready to, you know, fight tonight, and that's, that's their mission. The um, question of long-range precision fires um, has been a, a priority, especially for the Army, as it's going to give the United States and the Army and the Joint Force a lot more uh, ability to push back at the anti-access and area denial capabilities of countries like China. How, how are we progressing? How is the Army progressing with the long-range precision fires and the you know, move toward making sure that we have lethal long-range strikes that can um, deter conflict can make sure that we're not blackmailed from uh, introducing our forces forward to protect allies and partners? We are progressing really well. Uh, I mean, first of all, we're developing, you know, a whole suite of new systems for long-range precision fires, you know, from, from the extended range cannon artillery piece, for example, you know, all the way up to our hypersonic weapon, which is the long-range hypersonic weapon that right now we're sort of co-developing with the Navy. And that the, uh, the ground equipment for that first battery is already out uh, with a unit in um, Joint Base Lewis-McChord uh, in Washington State. Uh, we are on track to actually have the, the weapon system itself, the missile, if you will, be fielded in 23. Um, so we're we're doing very very well, I think, and you know we're also developing the precision strike missile. There are a few different increments that have um, you know a range of ranges, and then we also have mid range capabilities. So I think we feel really good about where the army is on in that part of our portfolio. And I want to ask you about the multi domain task force as it may be related to that, but sure. general on, on the long range precision fires, how do you see the progress in the field? No, actually, exactly what the secretary said. We're, we're very pleased with how fast this has moved. This is a three, four year program, you know, going from, you know, mm -hmm. an envelope or a, you know, to a, a fielded capability uh, is, is significant. And what it's going to give the, the, uh, the co combatant commanders is, is really multiple options. So when you, when you think about, you know, the fact that, um, you know, we'll be able to sink ships, you know, within a fairly good range. So you can even set up no sail type zones using uh, the mid-range capability. Have hypersonics in some of these long range systems. You can basically uh, suppress an integrated air and missile defense capability to give, you know, the joint force more capability and to uh, basically penetrate an anti-axis air denial capability. So there's a tremendous amount of capability uh, there that we, we, we think is going to provide a lot of options. Good. And the, the multi-domain task force, I mean, as I understand it, this really brings together the space, cyber, kinetic, non-kinetic effects that we're trying to bring on the battlefield. But um, presumably the long-range precision fires fits into that, but also the, the, the communications and networking. How, how is that progressing? And are we learning things out of Europe right now uh, that may change what we want to do in the Indo-Pacific as well? Yes, yes to all of that. I mean, we have we have an MDTF uh, for the Pacific. We have an MDTF in Europe. Uh, you know, we are we are ultimately planning to develop at least five multi-domain task forces. I think you know one thing that not everyone knows is that they are tailorable. I would say to the different theaters. You know, they it's not a one size fits all. Uh, you know, obviously the the distances that you're looking at in the Indo-Pacific theater are much, much greater than in the European context, for example. So, so on the fires um, battery that can be part of the MDTF, you know, the types of systems that you, you, would, you would see, you know, a lot of applicability, for example, to the long-range hypersonic weapon in the Indo-Pacific theater, whereas you might focus more on PRISM uh, for the European theater. But the other, the other part, and you alluded to it, Patrick, with the MDTF, is the focus on it's not just about kinetic fires, it's also about the non-kinetic fires. It's looking at how do we bring together cyber effects, how do we bring together electronic warfare, 
even you know information advantage. And uh, when you were talking to the chief a minute ago, you know I think that's something that we're really seeing um, in a very stark way in the European context is the importance of the information warfare that's happening. And the MDTF I think will allow us to be more skilled in that domain than we have been in the past. Indeed, the information domain coming out of uh, the Ukraine war uh, is a lesson every day in terms of how people are speaking or what's being cut off or how they're communicating. Um, are, we, are we going to be able to control the information battle space in the Indo-Pacific? Well, I don't think we want to control it. I think we want to make sure that you know we're, we're in a position to get the truth out. I, I think it's very, very powerful to lead with the truth, and we're seeing that happen in, in Ukraine. If you think about really what any type of conflict is all about. It's, it's someone trying to impose their will on someone else or, you know, and you want to make sure that, you know, you, you have the will to fight. And that can all be um, impacted by the information space and what's happening there. And I think it's really important for us to, to get the truth out, the lead with the truth. And I see that happening in Ukraine right now. And what you're doing is you're, you're uniting a whole bunch of people and you're turning them against what's happened. And I think that's what that really makes a difference when we talk with nation states. Of course, the Chinese are very good with their own information campaign, even denying the word invasion and then accusing the United States of uh, disinformation by um, saying that they're not uh, neutral in this war. They're not trying to seek peace. They're actually uh, on Russia's side to some extent. Um, I, you know, without getting into that political issue, the, yeah. the question of China's propaganda machine and political warfare machine, it's immense compared to, I think, what the U.S. has. Um, this is central to their... Uh, their political system uh, surviving. Yeah, well, I mean, we're more, really more, a little more challenged, I'd say, in a democracy, but, you know, yes. we have an obligation to um, certainly inform and educate the American people what's happening, and we do that, and we play by different rules, which makes it more difficult, but I, I still believe uh, if we stay true to our moral compass and do the right thing the right way, you know, the truth will precede it, and, and I, we're seeing that, you know, in Ukraine. There were some people said they weren't going to attack Ukraine when we had a pretty good idea they might. And so those type things are happening. And, and when people get to see, you know, with their own eyes, you know, because there's a lot of social media out there capturing what's happening, I think the truth can prevail. And when you're speaking, you know, uh, to the chief in India or the Philippines, uh, you have a good sense that you see eye to eye on most things? I think so. You know, it, it's interesting you talk about information uh, age. I mean, it, you know, we, we we want to make sure that, you know, they, a lot of these folks have been to our schools, and so they, mm -hmm. they know what we're about, they know about our values, and, and quite frankly, I think they respect them. Well, the power of strategic education. Um, I think we've uh, seen this, our, our, um, it's such a tool to build a network of like-minded people with the same kind of uh, interoperability skills, but also strategic, common strategic vision. Um, what's the Army doing to try to make sure that uh, we're building that network uh, for the future? Well, I mean, a few things. I know that General McConville can elaborate on this probably better than I can. But, you know, first of all, we have, uh, you know, we have officers from foreign militaries coming to our schools through IMET, for example. Uh, you know, we, we um, have our FAOs out. You know, we've got FAOs who are Northeast Asia, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, um, and, you know, that's another tool that we use. But, but I think, you know, General McConville probably can talk a little bit more since I know some of his colleagues have been in our schools. Yeah, you know, one of the best examples I can give is um, with the Thai military. Um, they, you know, their, their chief of staff had been in a lot of American schools, really appreciated the training. So we did a, a joint uh, training rotation with them at our, at our combat training centers. And usually they're going to send a small amount of people, about a company, about 150 soldiers, and you know get a chance to train with one, one of our brigades. What he did was he basically went to his military academy, the, equi the equivalent of his West Point. He took the entire, basically, about senior class, put them in that company because he wanted them to come to our schools to get that training experience, work with our leaders. And he thought it was that important to set so his entire year group of officers was going to have that experience. And, I, and that goes throughout how we do business with many of our allies and partners. And hopefully, coming out of COVID, we're able to do more of this in person than we, we are. We are, and we've been doing it ever since. So you know, okay. that did not stop us during COVID. 
So in the FAOs, the foreign area officers, I mean, I just briefed a, a, a large group of them, um, and what an impressive set of resumes and experiences these have. I mean, diverse from Rhodes Scholars to people who have had tremendous experience in the field for years, uh, you know, specifically uh, focused on big countries or, or, or you know, significant countries. Um, but are we developing that kind of expertise and bringing it into the decision-making centers as well? Um, where you are operating all the time in terms of all the, all the people you're dealing with, Secretary Wormuth, they're all making high-level policy decisions. Are we bringing that expertise that often gets, uh, in, in the case of this, the military services, um, put into boxes of expertise, um, you know, and go deal with the Thai, go deal with, you know, this country, um, up into the policy-making arena? You know, Patrick, we could probably do more of that, um, you know, given what assets our foreign area officers are. Uh, that said, you know, I can think of it, it's not an Indo-PACOM example, you know, but, but we're going to be selling uh, fantastic, extremely modern tanks to the Poles, for example. And this was something that was in motion before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. But the, the attache there, you know, was very, very helpful in terms of, um, you know, working with us as we were in that dialogue with the Poles. And, and uh, our FAO there, you know, did have a role, I would say. You know, they weren't piping into the Situation Room. I mean, frankly, we weren't talking about the sale of Polish tanks in the Situation Room. But, but they were able to bring their perspective, I think, to our, to our thinking about going forward. But that's probably an asset that we could leverage a little bit more. And how about in the field, General? No, I think they're, they're, they're absolutely uh, critical to what we're doing. Um, as a sector, every time we go somewhere to deal with any foreign leader, our FAOs are there. They're, they're bringing us up to speed. When you go down and meet with them, they're in the room. They're there to provide that insight. They're at a chaise. They're doing all those critical roles. And so I think they're uh, a, a critical part, especially when we don't have a lot of presence. So what we're seeing in the future is, you know, a lot of places we're not going to have a brigade inside this this country. So that that FAO, that attaché, if 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 he's uh, he or she is highly qualified, is working very closely with the senior leadership of that country, getting the right resources in there, getting the right training, making sure they get an opportunity to go to school, and and setting up you know helping facil facilitate exercises. So I think they're extremely important. When you're thinking about small uh, partners like. Taiwan, uh, they become force multipliers in terms of understanding uh, the complex situation on the ground and what's happening, um, where we don't necessarily have a lot of people on the ground. Right. No, I think I think it's really important for opening up avenues for mm -hmm. us. You know, understanding, you know, where their interests are and what they, you know, mm -hmm. may be receptive to and not receptive as we develop these relationships. I've found them very, very important in my my travels. Um, we talked about exercises uh, in the opening, um, but I'm very impressed with um, you know, the exercises right now with the Philippines where we're taking advantage of prepositioned afloat forces. Um, can you speak to that, um, Secretary Wormuth, and talk about whether we have uh, the adequate funding to make sure that we can pr fully preposition the kinds of forces that we saw in Europe being so effective to get the readiness uh, of our troops? Um, working with allies like the Philippines, say, should there be uh, a dust-up in the South China Sea? That's a great point. It is something, you know, General McConville has been um, observing quite a bit in the last couple of weeks that, you know, the fact that we had the preposition stocks that we had in Europe was a big part of why we were able to move as quickly and effectively as we have. So I think it speaks to the importance of having that in the Indo-Pacific theater. And this is something, you know, I think we're trying to look at where can we build that out and how can we perhaps um, use the, the prepo that we have in theater already in more effective ways. So when General Flynn was in town recently, we were talking about, you know, offloading some of those stocks and actually using them to do some training and then loading them back onto the ships. Um, we're very interested in, I think, looking for more opportunities to have prepo in theater. Um, you know, I think it's really great that Secretary Austin was able to um, make the progress with the, with the agreement with the Philippines to be able to sort of, you know, um, open back up some of that hard work we did on the EDCA uh, in uh, a few years ago. Um, but part of that is, you know, we've got to let the diplomacy, the defense diplomacy, move forward. But I think we'd be very interested in finding more opportunities to have greater prepo in the theater. And, and I think, I think by way of example, you know, as you see what's going on in Europe, you know, we, we've had 
pre-position stocks over there for quite a while. But what we did about two years ago, we really invested in them because, mm -hmm. you know, it's nice to have tanks and all these different type things, but if they're not the most modern tanks, if they're not kept up to speed, it's like putting a vehicle um, in a garage for two years and then we're going out to start it and then you have to use it and there's cobwebs. That's not what we did at all. This was the, you know, we put the very best equipment in there. So when our soldiers went over there, they, they was immediately ready. They were able to draw it. We basically had um, the 82nd drawer and the infantry brigade worth of equipment and we had a, an armored brigade combat team drawer and armored brigade and, it, and they're doing it in days and with, with the transportation that saves and everything else, it makes things very, very quick. This is where the politics have been um, preventing some good things from happening that could have happened in Thailand uh, because of the junta that we're still able to deal with very well these days with Cobra Gold and other exercises, but we're coming back out of a hole with that relationship. In the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte has been a, a delicate uh, partner to have as an ally, um, and yet, uh, you're right, Secretary Austin was able to go back and give the Visiting Forces Agreement, uh, sort of re-signed up for that get the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, the EDCA, uh, back on track, start to get those multiple sites around the Philippine archipelago ready for exercising training, pre-positioning. Um, and they have an election in May, and we're likely to see, you know, uh, a Marcos. <laughs> uh, That's right. You know, uh, ascend. <laughs> the sun. <laughs> exactly. The sun, uh, bong bong Marcos, um, rise to power. And that, um, that bodes for another complicated relationship, and yet I think there's still going to be progress there, an opportunity for the Army to keep moving along with the other services uh, with a, a critical piece of, uh, of, of Asia Pacific. The Philippines is right in the middle, um, so, so critically important. I wonder if I can ask about a very different uh, part, and that's the Arctic, uh, so in, in the Arctic strategy, and what is the role of the Army in, in the Arctic? So going from you know, the middle of the Indo-Pacific to you know, something that is outside of the Indo-Pacific technically, but um, it relates to it. So what, what is the Army's role in, in, in Arctic? Yeah, we've been trying to push our thinking about that. Uh, and the Army put out a climate strategy, I think, in March of last year. Uh, um, and, you know, right now we have a, an administrative headquarters up there. You know, we've got forces, obviously, that can, um, that can uh, work with Indo-PACOM to do, you know, Arctic types of training, you know, whether it's with Japan, for example, example or India. But I think um, there's more that we can do, and we've been looking at, you know, how can we um, perhaps build out on the capability that we have in the Arctic right now. It's obviously a very important, you know, strategic location, uh, and I think, you know, it, you can actually, you know, our forces there could get to the Indo-PACOM theater more quickly than our forces in Hawaii, actually. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is something that we're looking at. You know, it's certainly, I think, something to look at vis-a-vis -vis Russia. You know, there's very much a view that the Arctic needs to remain. You know, we've been a, um, a, a good citizen, I would say, on the Arctic Council for many years. Um, I think the, the strong desire of the United States is to keep the Arctic, a, um, you know, defensively oriented. And we're, you know, in support of that. But we are looking at how we can do more uh, with Army forces there to contribute. Absolutely. This is where the, the enemy gets a vote, though. So if uh, Russia or China, China, so-called near-Arctic country, as yeah. Sof described, uh, wants to militarize the Arctic or, or space, um, we have to find ways to respond. How, how do you see the Arctic, General? Well, I, I see it as a potential um, you know, campaigning area, if you want, or competitive space. I think uh, we need to have those type capabilities. And, um, as the Secretary said, we do have forces up there. We have an Airborne Brigade, and we have a Striker Brigade. But historically, we looked at it as a basing option. Move the Striker Brigade you know, over into the Pacific or do something with that. We can envision you know, having an Arctic-type brigade that's equipped, trained you know, for, the, for, the, for the coldest periods of time. And they also have uh, the maneuverability uh, in that environment. Strikers are good for certain terrain, but you know, when you start to get into you know, heavy snow and those type things, um, you know, we're taking a hard look at what, what, how that brigade should be equipped. And there's other opportunities, you know, when it comes to multi-domain task forces, what, what type of capabilities would we want to tailor up there? And as the Secretary said, the, the headquarters historically has been administrative type headquarters. We can see that becoming more operationally because you may want to employ those forces up in that area and you want a capability to do that. Yeah, my father was in the Aleutian Islands during World War II and uh, was not hospitable territory. Yeah. And that's, Minus 30 <laughs> degrees in the yeah. winter. <laughs> that, that's short of the Arctic. 
Um, I want to turn to a, a serious topic about the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, on the one hand, uh, our troops are so experienced from the recent wars. Uh, on the other hand, very contentious issue of, of withdrawing from Afghanistan. But putting that aside, what, what are the lessons that we should be taking forward out of the experience of the Afghan war? You know, I think one of the big lessons, I think, for um, looking across the, the full 20 years of our involvement in Afghanistan is, is uh, there are at least two I can think of. One is I think we have to constantly be asking ourselves, what are the vital national interests that are at stake in any given situation? And frankly, I think if you look at, you know, how the United States is handling the current invasion of Ukraine, that question is, I think, front and center. And that is, um, you know, a big part of why, you know, we have made it very clear that we're going to defend every inch of, of NATO territory, but, um, you know, provide assistance to Ukraine. And I think that's grounded in thinking about what are our vital national interests, you know, vis-a-vis -vis a nuclear armed country, for example. And, and I think, you know, just reflecting on my own experience as a policymaker at the time, you know, for a portion of those years, um, sometimes we spent a lot more time talking about, you know, should we have 40,000 troops or 80,000 troops and not as much time talking about what are we trying to do there, what is at stake, and are we, you know, making progress towards the goal that we've set. And I think the other thing um, that I see, you know, more tactically in a way, looking at, at how we left Afghanistan, is um, always question your assumptions. You know, we, and this was, you know, the, the intelligence community, uh, you know, was very much of the view that the, um, you know, the Afghan government was not going to collapse quickly, you know, that it would take the Taliban weeks and potentially months, you know, to take over the country. And that didn't prove to be true. Um, but assumptions are key. And again, if you look at Ukraine and Russia, I think, you know, going to the chief's point about logistics, I think um, Vladimir Putin assumed that the Ukrainians would crumble rapidly. And hence, he didn't have to worry about a lot of fuel, a lot of supplies and things like that. Well, that assumption was fatally flawed. General, your thoughts on this lessons? Yeah, I think, you know, as, when, I, when I take a look back, certainly did not like the way that ended. You know, many of us had served multiple combat tours there. All my kids have served there. My mm. son-in-law served there. And my son was there at the, you know, the last minutes. And so, uh, but I think as we take a step back and we take a look at, you know, what happened. We went there to get bin Laden. We were successful in getting bin Laden. We went there to make sure that al-Qaeda al was not operational. They were not uh, operation for 20 years. Uh, and then we built, you know, we, we tried to give the Afghans an opportunity for a future. We built a security force. And I think, we, you know, we talked about it. We gave them the capabilities I think they needed. They were well, you know, equipped. Uh, we gave them the capacity. There was, you know, a, a certain, you know, enough people there to defend the country. But for some reason or other, we, the assumption that they would stay and fight and they would stay and govern, uh, those assumptions were, you know, did not turn out to be what they were. And, um, and by then, we had, you know, we were in a, a very challenging situation, and that's how it ended. The, the violent extremism, uh, of course, goes on globally, transnationally, but a lot of it's popping up in Africa, still in the Middle East, but parts of Southeast Asia as well. How do, how do you view the uh, violent extremist uh, threat and what the Army is still doing, for instance, what we've done in places like uh, the Philippines to help uh, allies and partners combat uh, radical jihadism and other threats? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, first of all, we have to, you know, keep our eye on the violent extremist threat, uh, particularly in terms of are there groups out there that pose, again, you know, a real threat to the United States homeland or a significant threat to close allies, for example. You know, those kinds of threats, I think, have to be dealt with. Uh, but, but, you know, a lot of the other VEO threat is going to be sort of a, a, a slow, you know, steady thing that's just going to be out there. But the Army has, you know, tremendous capabilities to be helpful in that regard, you know, particularly in terms of our special operations forces. Uh, you know, they're, they're always going to, I think, be very relevant in terms of dealing with the threat. But, you know, also our SFABs, which were originally designed, frankly, more focusing on building partner capacity in the CENTCOM AOR, for example, um, is also another great tool to help countries be better able to defend themselves against the VEO threat. In general, your thoughts on this, the level of the threat in the region? 
Well, I, th I, I think the, um, you know, the threat is there. The violent extremist groups are not going away, but I agree with the Secretary. We need to do all we can through the appropriate advice and assistance for them to help them solve the problem that they have. And, you know, giving them the capability, giving them the capacity that they need. Uh, our special forces can certainly train high-end uh, units in, in, their, um, in their countries, along with our SFABs, which can build a conventional capability for security. But at the end of the day, those countries are going to have to do it. You know, they need to be the lead, and they need to be responsible for security. We can support them, we can help them, but we can't do it for them. Um, Secretary Wormuth, as time winds down here, I want to turn back to allies and partners in particular because this has been a centerpiece of the administration's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, global strategy, really, is to work on building that collective effort. In the Indo-Pacific, there's no NATO, obviously. There is something called the Quad. Um, and those Quad countries, while they're at the moment focused on the positive agenda and not sort of the negative agenda, as our Indians will remind us, uh, at the same time, a lot of latent potential and a lot of overlapping bilateral and trilateral cooperation with Japan, Australia, India, on real security issues. And a place like India, massive army. Um, Australia and Japan more oriented toward, of course, uh, maybe the, the naval and air component, but, but land forces continue to be a very important part. How, are, how do you see the cooperation with those particular countries? I think the Quad, uh, you know, is a really important sort of security mechanism, if you will, or sort of, I should say, you know, regional mechanism, because as you alluded to, the Quad has really not, uh, particularly with India, focused or highlighted the security dimension. But we have a lot going on bilaterally with each of those countries in the security dimension. I think that's, you know, really important. And I think, you know, India is moving. I mean, as I look at where India was, you know, in 2010 compared to where it is today, uh, you know, I, I think India has grown increasingly concerned about China, uh, looking at how China has been operating in the region. And um, the MacArthur Foundation actually did a, commissioned a, a study from RAND a couple of years ago that was looking at um, cooperation um, of countries in the region with each other, not even with the United States, but one of the biggest drivers of more defense cooperation, defense investment was Chinese actions. And so I think the, the Quad is a really important mechanism for us. I think those three countries are incredibly important. Um, you know, the, the Australians are incredible partners for us in the Army. We have a lot of activity with them. They're, I think, very receptive to doing more with us. So I think we really should, and, and, and the Quad, frankly, has gotten China's attention. You know, they're, they're, I think, a little nervous about what's happening in the Quad. I think so. General, any thoughts on the Quad countries? No, we, we have very strong relationships with each of their armies. I've personally met with their chiefs, and uh, they're, they're very interested in working together. We train together, we work together, and uh, I think we share a lot of the similar interests in the region. I wonder if I can just turn inward the audiences you have to deal with every day, um, you know, whether it's the Joint Chiefs of Staff or whether you're dealing with uh, the Secretary of Defense and other secretaries uh, around the region, um, how much of a common, of a consensus is there um, that China indeed poses the pacing threat and challenge for the United States and for the region? Um, and uh, do we, are we like-minded enough to be willing to act in, in sort of uh, a common strategy? Certainly, I think there's a very strong consensus, you know, inside the United States government, uh, particularly sort of in, you know, state defense, the intelligence community, that China is the pacing threat. But, you know, I've been um, very pleased. I think that there, that is a, um, a fairly strong shared understanding with countries in the region as well. And I think, you know, again, looking at how China is handling the, the situation with Russia and Ukraine right now, I think is getting the attention of the Europeans in terms of how they look at China and certainly um, getting the attention of countries in the region. I just had a, a senior Australian defense official um, come and see me a week or two ago, uh, and I thought we would talk you know, quite a bit about Indo-PACOM, but um, they were talking about how focused they are and what's happening with, with, with Europe and what it means for Indo-PACOM. So I think there's a, a, a strong and growing consensus. In general, what about among the chiefs and your counterparts? No, I think so. I think that's, I mean, we, we're certainly in line with the national defense strategy. And, um, you know, and we're also realized there's other 
concerns we have out there, like what's going on in Ukraine. But you're seeing an in, in, a, a inter, you know, some type of connectedness. So it's not what we, what we take a look at it. It's just not one theater. It's just not in Asia. It impacts the whole world. All these events are because of you know, the way the economies are tied together, the way diplomacy is tied together. They they all impact. So if something happens in Ukraine, it affects China right now, and it affects the rest of the world. So we just need to be aware of that. And uh, uh, you know, the value of having a whole bunch of partners come together, and it's not just Europeans that are coming together on this. There's people. Uh, throughout the world that, that realize that this is a serious incident going on in Ukraine right now. And, you know, Patrick, just a two-finger on that really quickly. You know, I think we fully understand that we don't want to force countries in Indo-PACOM to choose. You know, that's not what this is about. So, you know, we recognize that countries that live in the neighborhood are going to want to have trade relationships and so on. And, you know, I think they often, most of them, look at the United States as the security partner of choice. But I think, you know, again, all of those countries are looking at those relationships and, and dynamics in real time and making some shifts. Well, our, I see our hour has flown by. Um, and uh, Secretary Wormuth and General McConville, on behalf of Hudson Institute, thank you so much for your service and for your time and insights. And good luck to, to you both. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks Great for to be here. Thank Appreciate you. It.